everybody. My name is Sharon Quinn. I am also known as the original runway diva, and you are watching Model Behavior. Class is officially in session. Today, my guest is Leonard Davis, and I want to tell you a little bit about Leonard. Leonard Davis is a style maker, fashion designer, black Americana collector, author, and producer of fashion events. He is responsible for the beautiful backdrops that you see every year at Full Figured Fashion Week. Welcome, Leonard, to Model Behavior. Thanks for having me. Now, I know you want to talk a lot about fashion, so we're going to jump right into it. Um, tell me, I know that you're a, super, a superb event producer, but a lot of not, not a lot of people know that you're a fashion designer as well. Let's talk a little bit about that. How did you get started in fashion? Fashion. Um, well, from an early age, uh, actually in high school, I was a part of the school newspaper. Really? On the staff, I wanted to be a writer at the time, I thought. And I started a fashion column because we were looking for ideas as how to get the students to read the school newspaper. Nobody read that newspaper. And um, I said, what about a fashion column? And so the one young lady was, was doing the sketches, and I was writing the captions under the sketches. Okay. And she decided to let it go. She was tired of doing it. So you took it over? So I took it over. Okay. And I started trying to trace and draw. My mother, you know, mama can make a big difference. She saw the sketches and said, that's beautiful. And I said, it is? And she said, yes, that's great. You're talented. I said, I am? And so the next thing I know, I keep seriously sketching and drawing and really taking an interest in what I was doing and uh, just sort of segued into becoming So you knew a at that moment that this is yeah, what you wanted to that do? that was what I wanted to do. Now, you, you, you're very, very serious about schooling and getting the word out there how important education is. Yes. How did you... But what was the process that you went through? The process, well, my father instilled in, in all of us, all my brothers and all, that the education was important. Um, and to get it while you're in school, when you go to college the first time, get the highest education that you can get. Okay. Okay? Or, or, or the point is, when you come out, you want to be with and among the best and the brightest. Okay. So you don't want to have at any point a reason why you have to step back. I mean, we're living in the age of Obama. Yes. So, you know, so you can come forward now, okay, but you must be prepared. You must be amongst the best and the brightest. So in the field of, in, this is a creative field, mm -hmm. okay, so it's art. And so there are a lot of talented people out there, okay. So if you're really at the table, you really want to compete with everybody on every level. And just because you're talented doesn't always win. Sometimes you have to also realize that the people who are at the table are not only talented, they're also brilliant, they're smart, they have their credentials, they have their education. Do you? Okay. So, you, so I get what you're saying. Yes. But what are some of, t take me through the steps. The steps, well, I'm saying, okay, one thing in particular, when you're saying designer in particular, mm -hmm. there's several different types of designers. So they're independent designers who make their own clothing and they uh, produce them and whatever on a private level. So that designer works for themselves. Okay. And so I'm a commercial designer. So I worked for large companies like Liz Claiborne, Chaus, Adriana Papel, um, uh, uh, Don Kenny. These are large manufacturers of clothing. And they make their clothing off of your designs, or you design what they ask you to. Well, to here's design. what I'm here's what I'm here's what I'm going to. Okay. okay. As an African American designer, mm -hmm. you're coming to a manufacturer, and you have it. There's there's an onus that's on us that's not on other people. Culturally, oh. when you show up. You have to understand that the end user, in this case, is not African American. Okay. The demographic that they're after is not African American. However, here you are, and you have a challenge, therefore, to convince them that you have the aesthetic, mm -hmm. you have the, uh, the talent, the ability to produce, to direct, to design, create clothing for a person that is not of your cultural background. Oh. Okay? Which comes to the question, I mean, because you're a model, very often people will say to the designers, we have the, the, the issue about diversity on the runway. Mm -hmm. Why aren't there more uh, African-American models on the runway? Don't the designers have the wherewithal to dictate who's going to be in their dresses and why don't the designers select? Actually, no. Because if you work for a manufacturer, the first responsibility was 
on myself for me to stay there in the company. I'm a hired designer. Mm -hmm. I'm a staff designer. And so if I'm there, I have therefore convinced the manufacturer that I have the aesthetic that to produce clothing for the end user who's not African American. Now that I've convinced them of that, why would I therefore turn around and say, but let's display the clothes yeah. on African American models whom you know that they have already decided that's not the end user. So it's, it's, it's deep like that? Yes, it is. Because as far as I know, African Americans spend millions, if not billions of dollars, uh, shopping for clothes on 7th Avenue. So Well, then we have to we come to awareness. So awareness is that we have to support our own, okay. our own designers. Okay, or withhold our dollars, or, or therefore we can, that's where the boycott, that's where the force comes in to give us the leverage to say we want to see more diversity on the, on the runway. On the, because the trade shows, the, the fashion shows, the Lincoln Center shows mm -hmm. are trade shows. They're not consumer shows. Now explain that. Explain the difference between a trade show and a consumer show, because a lot of people don't know. Right. Well, the, the shows that... that when you see Fashion Week, mm -hmm. okay, the shows that they have that are professional models that are whatever, the audience that's there, our buyers, our fashion press, that's the trade, the fashion trade. Okay. Okay. So that's a trade show for the trade, the fashion trade. So typically, the models just have to walk. Sometimes people complain that the girls don't have swagger and it's not all of that or whatever because it's a trade show. And it's not an, a show for entertainment. Right. Okay, and so therefore, when the manufacturer, the person who is, whose money this is, okay, mm, okay. They, it's their determination as to how they want to display the clothing and who they expect, who's the end user, who's the customer that they are trying to promote to, which isn't us. Wow. But we, so it's up to, it's for us to get that message. So how do, but how do, how do we change that sort of thing? I know you said we should shop support our own support our own or with withhold your dollars and just say since you don't advertise to me then i'm not going to buy your clothing okay i can see how it's easy to say that but then who's going to dress you if if our own is not bringing it the way we want them it's to just bring like it. the bu the bus boycott from the uh, 60s if you don't ride the bus and they start losing revenue they will respond they will put as many african-american models as they need to because they need your you know saying so if we start rebelling in some particular organized type of way and i think beth ann hardison has been one of the champions of uh, in leading us in that direction of trying to get more diversity on the runway and trying to find ways for us to challenge that, to now, challenge the industry to see how and why and where we can realize that they not just have one, because many try to appease us by showing one, and in many cases, the same one. Yeah, well, okay. I, I know how that goes. Our girls are not getting the work. And our designers are also not, because when you come as a fashion designer, African American into the industry, Part of it is social. A lot of it is social in terms of, of what people consider to be a fit. Uh, everyone's talented, and many people that come to the table are talented. But then they're looking at you to see, well, if you fit into our group, our culture of this company, socially. Well, let, well I remember coming up back in, like, the 70s, you had the uh, uh, Willie Smiths and... I can't remember his name, Patrick Kelly's, and you, you had a lot of African-American designers and a lot of African-American models on the runway. None of them were plus size, but they were, you know, we, was, they was the, we were still represented. Right. When and how did that, did that shift, shift? The shift changed. Well, and, and as a matter of fact, you said, Willie, so, well, let me tell you a bit of my, my fashion background. So I went to FIT, okay. the Fashion Institute, and like I told you, my direction and focus was to get the highest education I could get while I was getting it. My mm -hmm. father was, was adamant about that. So I went to Fashion Institute, and then I went to school in Paris. Ecole de la Chambre Syndicale Couture. Ooh. And so I got my couture certificate, and then I worked in Paris for two years. Wait a minute. You say you got, what's a couture certificate? Uh, to, I went, the Chambre Syndicale is the union. It's the fashion, it's the couture union school oh, okay. in Paris to train you to be a couture designer. So I went to the, that school, okay, and then upon graduating, 
it's a certificate. We get with diploma, certificate. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what you, upon graduating. At that point, then you are eligible to work as an apprentice okay. at one of the couture houses. So I worked at the house of Cherer, Jean Louis Cherer, oh. for a couple of years, and then I came back to America. When I got back, it was difficult to find a job in couture, but the first door that opened for me was Willie Smith. Really? And I had the opportunity to work with Willie Smith as an assistant until his past, till he passed away. And what was that experience like working I'm for a, a designer that looked like you? Yes, fantastic. And that's kind of, again, the experience is that we are out there, African Americans, and we have the ability to pull one another in. You know, so you're saying that we don't do that now? We, a lot don't. A lot don't. A lot of people get in and they close the door behind them. They're in, and when they get the opportunity to hire an assistant, when they get the opportunity to pull one of us in, very often you see that we don't. You know, we don't follow that rule. But I was blessed that I went for an interview with Willie, and others were there, and Willie said, you, come here. Okay, all of you are on the same level. You're all talented and you all don't know anything. You don't have the experience, but I'm going to give you a chance. And I thank God that that opportunity came to me at that time. So after that door opened for you, then dare I say other doors opened? Oh, yes, absolutely. Because again, with that name on my resume at that time, and I, that was my first opportunity to go to India. That was my first opportunity to learn about production, to go through some of the ups and downs. Because Willie went through transition. Before he got to Willie Wear, there was uh, cinnamon ware, paprika, Willie Wu, and then, so he was also going through the process of getting backers and sponsors, mm -hmm. and then he would, you know, start up his business again under another assumed name, and then he would start again and again and again. So he was learning and finding his way as well, which I was there as, as part of the learning experience to seeing his rigors of, of finding his way how to get a backer and start his own company, keep a company going, and what it entailed. And you this know. is knowledge that is still important Absolutely. today. You can't just decide that you want to design a line and you don't know how to draw, you don't know how to sew, you don't know how to do anything, right. but you can get somebody to make, you have ideas and you can get somebody to make the clothing for right. you. Right, but it doesn't stop there because again, it's all about financing. If you, when you get an order from a buyer, mm -hmm. okay, for 100 pieces, 200, 500 pieces or whatever, do you know what to do next? You did, you made the samples and you showed some, some clothing, but do you know what yeah. to do next? When you Production. get an order, you don't get any money with the order. You just get an order. You have, have to, to finance it. You have to get the raw materials and manufacture it and deliver $500 addresses. And very often the terms are net 30, net 60, net 90. <laughs> so you may not get paid for 30, for three months right. after you deliver. This is how FUBU got started. Yeah. They got all these orders that they couldn't fulfill. So I believe they took out an ad That's right. and, and got a backer. A back but it doesn't always work out that way. Well, again, and then... And, this is all riddled with landmines. The whole process is all riddled with pitfalls and landmines. You learn. You learn how to, to dodge them. But as, as you go along, buyers can cancel orders. Buyers can find little, you know, imperfections in the clothing or whatever and decide they want a discount. And you can't, when you lose profit, what do you do? Well, you said they can cancel an order? Yeah. So then what, you, you're just stuck with 500 pieces of garments that you, you can't use? Wow. It can happen. So these are some of the pitfalls and some of the, you know, real hazardous conditions that designers, especially if you're an independent designer, I've learned because I've worked as a staff designer in many cases for companies. So it wasn't at my expense. Those, But at the end of the day, I would also still have someone taps you on the shoulder and says, guess what? We're going out of business. You know, because the larger the order, the, the more hazardous it can be. Right, so and if somebody for, cancels an order, that could sink your business. I'm talking about a Walmart, Sears, Kmart order to do for 100,000 units, 100,000 jackets. Imagine if, if, if that got canceled. You know, a million dollar, two million dollar order and something goes wrong in the delivery. You know, you're, you're bringing this merchandise in from overseas. There's a glitch. You're bringing it by boat. 
the boat got capsized, there's a storm, whatever, you got late. So you can't, there's no sort of insurance to protect you? Oh my God. The, it's riddled with landmines. And so designers need to know that. And then that's a part of the process in the business or whatever, which not at any, due to any fault of your own, you're also no, not employed. He's out of business and you're also not employed. And what happened? Well, the company took a hit. They lost a big order, and guess what? You're out of business. They're, you know, you're out looking for a job. What did you do wrong? Nothing. Well, my, who this may, may, may next my, make my next question moot. Um, I was going to ask you if, have you ever thought of, you know, designing your own line and putting it out there? I had attempted to it initially, but I was always more geared towards being a commercial designer and doing commercial clothing rather than doing what everybody assumes to be a, a designer of, of, of red carpet gowns and doing fabulous things or whatever. Because in those cases, you're really selling one dress at a time. You know what I'm saying? To, you're well, that's the reality. Appealing to one person or one client or whatever like that. And then that's a slower process. And then if you can build from there, you can't. Byron Lawrence has done it, you know, a number of this with Stephen Burroughs, you know, so it can be done. It has been done numerous times. But again, you're at the behest of your, you know, backers who's supporting you financially. And it's about who you know. So, yeah. so networking is really, Real really good. It's important. Also, fashion, a greater component of fashion is social. It's all about networking. It's all about being out there socially. Who you know. What right. you said, who you know. This is fascinating. <laughs> but, and it really is, because I'm learning so much stuff that I didn't know before. But I really I want to talk to you also about the production piece. Yes. Um, I want to know, one, how did, you, how did you come across event production? What was, what was the, the, the light bulb that went off in your head that said, I, I think I can do this? As a student at the Fashion Institute, they are getting trained in terms of being a fashion designer. We often, of course, have fashion shows every week because that's what we do, okay. fashion shows. And we, at that time, had a group called the Soul Club. You know, this was back in the <laughs> Black Power days, <laughs> Student Union Day, Black Student Union. And we had a show, and I would criticize always because I was all about the presentation. Mm -hmm. The designers are backstage fussing and fighting over their dresses and picking at the models and prepping and getting ready to show their beautiful dresses. But no one was thinking from an audience perspective, what is the audience seeing? What does she see there on the stage? There's no staging, there was no production, and no one was concerned about that. And so that became important to me, not only that, but the commentary. So and back in the day, I suddenly got involved in commentary. Oh, you've done that too? Yeah, and okay. fashion show production. Because you know what? I was back, it was during the time when fashion, Ebony Fashion Fair was flying high. Oof. And that, the format, that was really a template for the perfect fashion show, not a trade show, which right. you've already discussed. And more, this is more of an entertainment, entertainment show. show okay. For the consumer, a consumer show, mm -hmm. okay? You're entertaining them with the fashions. But you couldn't you buy, you couldn't like, you couldn't put in orders for that stuff, right? No. Okay. Uh, essentially, no. You're just coming for just spectator, right. you know, sake, you know, just being entertained, uh, your, your son, your daughter, whoever are designing, and this is their presentation among many garments that are going to be shown, and they have a garment in the show, and so that's why we're here. It's entertainment. Yeah, okay? I, I went for many, many years. Yeah. You know, that, in our community, that, that was like your, your baptism into fashion. Absolutely. You had to go check out Ebony So I got there. involved in production from that angle and started realizing that what about the runway? What about the look? What about the presentation? It's like from the, in the restaurant business, there's a hamburger on a napkin and here's a hamburger on a plate. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? This is the $1 hamburger and this is the $15 hamburger deluxe. Presentation. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Presentation. It's important. And so for a designer to present your clothing in an atmosphere where there's a fabulous spectacle, then your garment looks fantastic. I mean, you've seen Victoria's mm -hmm. Secret, the staging mm -hmm. there, whatever. Amazing. You've been to Radio City? Mm -hmm. What if the stage goes up and down and it snows and it rains and they have steamships going across and whatever? <laughs> oh, my God. That's amazing. So I was captured by all of that wonderful spectacle of staging mm -hmm. and presenting and realize for fashion, that's what we don't have a lot of. The other aspect of fashion that we've gone away from, because many people, again, are following the model of the trade show is, mm -hmm. for the consumer, we've gotten away from commentary. 
there was a point where fashion shows always had a commentator. Yeah, absolutely. That's when someone who's explaining to you what you're looking at. Right. Right. As a consumer, at a trade show, they know what they're looking at. These are fashion editors, stylists, buyers. They know what they're looking at. As a consumer at a fashion show, no one's talking to you. So you don't really right. get a, a description so of the So my education in fashion was at the Ebony Fashion Fair, Miss Audrey Smoltz yes, was sir. sitting there, and that's the first time I ever heard the word chinchilla. Mm. That was the first time I ever heard blue Norwegian fox. <laughs> the name is Givenchy. The name Eve is Saint I heard her say those things, and I was like, wow, wow. And I walked out of there. But the Urban League sponsored that show. Mm -hmm. And all of those ladies that were there, the socialites, all, all came out of there going, wow, Givenchy. Everybody came out of there saying, that is something from, that's a European. Mrs. Eunice Johnson went and spent $10,000 on that Maximilian fur coat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So people, we walked out of there with an education, an education in fashion, not just simply having been entertained with the clothing. We knew the difference between pot de soie and silk chiffon. And let's not sleep, a good commentator can keep a show flowing <laughs> yeah. when it hits a low point. It's important. It's so important. And we've gotten away from that at this point. So I think I wish and I hope that we can also in our fashion presentations bring that aspect back to the public and educate them, especially for this new generation, educate them about fabrics, about styling, the names, and also the names of designers, the names of our emerging designers to hear the name, because we're not hearing the names, so that's why the name is not in our ear. So you, you, you saying as opposed to projecting it on the screen, right. along with projecting it on the screen, right. say it. Say the name. Because so very often whatever is being projected, I don't know the correct pronunciation. That's true. They're abstract yeah, I, names, I <laughs> hyphenated names, and <laughs> I, you, know, you, got, you know, you don't know, and it's just a flash because you're still watching the clothing, but at the end of a presentation, and you love something. And then what was the name and you don't know and then another presentation starts. So you don't walk out of there with that name in your ear because you didn't hear it. Now, is it, is it expensive? Well, I know it's expensive. Who am I fooling? I know it's expensive. But how expensive is it to put on a decent, maybe not, maybe not you know, top, top of the line, because I know that costs a lot. You need the backing for that. Right. But to put on a decent fashion show, how, how much do you think capital oh, you should have. A decent fashion, okay. Well, keep starts, in mind a decent is, is maybe different things to different it's, people. It's relative, right. Because uh, obviously we start with venue. Mm -hmm. We start with the, where, where it's going to be or whatever. Some people, uh, one, I know a guy that has a fashion show at, uh, at Newark. In Newark, he got a, a deal working with one of the public uh, facilities or whatever, and he's able to get the place for a nominal fee. So it's low overhead for him mm -hmm. and he and it's a brilliant it's a large wonderful room um some places you know but is it hard you know, to get people to come to, to come? Newark? If, well no not in his case because he has a, he has a following okay and it's and it's a, a line is so amazing he's so talented i mean and that's one circumstance i'm saying there are other people maybe here in the city who if you can get lucky and get a venue or get a price for a venue because typically the lower on the lower end for a lovely ballroom or whatever you're talking, maybe ten thousand dollars a city, and then you got to pay for catering. That, yeah, it, it, it if gets you want to have food or whatever, and that makes it really hard. Right, for but if you want to get a ballroom, you want to set it up or whatever, you could be talking upwards of ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars just for the place, just to get the venue. Not to mention the cost of you producing your clo your line, uh, your paying the models, hair, makeup. You just say that paying the models piece again, please. Yeah. 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 Well, Pay your don't models. Always think they, you know, they want to bother it with the models and uh, whatever. But in any case, um, you know, it can it can get rather costly depending on how professional, how crisp, how wonderful you want your show to be, your presentation. And it's about presentation you're, once again. You're talking twenty, thirty. Th that's a lot of money. Well, again, but but now. The, the better your presentation, the more apt you are to get orders. Uh, I mean, isn't that the bottom line that we're trying to get orders at the end of the day? So you want your consumer who's sitting there to be, you know, really, you know, dazzled with your clothing. And a lot of it has to do with presentation. 
Wow, Leonard, this is, oh my God, this is fascinating stuff. And it, there's so much stuff that I haven't even touched on. <laughs> but I, I know that we are, we're down to like the three minute mark, so I can't really keep talking to you. Okay, like, well, yeah. lights out. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I want you to come back, because okay. you, you definitely have a lot of knowledge to share. People need to hear this. This was, this was really, really informative. And I, I, I thank you for coming. Um, but like I said, we're almost out of time. So I'd like to thank Leonard Davis for sharing his industry knowledge with us today. Now before I go, I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. I want you to remember that you can't change the game until you first learn the game. And remember to always surround yourself with positive people and positive things. And lastly, always do what you love and love what you do. Thanks for watching Model Behavior. My name is Sharon Quinn and I'll see you all next week. Class is officially dismissed. Bye. And this is good.